Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm Nick Yulman, Design and Technology Lead here at Kickstarter, and we're really, really pleased to have you here for the last of our series of Design Month events, where you know, all this month we've been celebrating the design category in Kickstarter, and um, really honored to have a great panel of people who have been involved with great Kickstarter projects here to talk about building an audience for your design project here. And so just before we get started, um, I would love to see a show of hands. How many of you have actually run a Kickstarter campaign before? OK, so yeah, nice, nice representation. And then how many of you have one in the works or are thinking about it? Great, so that's just about everybody. Um, I won't ask who's backed one, because if you haven't backed a project, you shouldn't be here, so <laughs> um, great. <laughs> Um, so before we jump into the panel, um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of just you know, the design category on Kickstarter and sort of how we think about audience development and the story that you're telling with your campaign. Um, so you know, as I said, I am a design and technology lead here, which means I just have the honor of working with creators in those two very diverse dynamic categories. Um, you know, it's everything from product designs and you know, graphic design, the kind of traditional um, disciplines you might think of with design, but also, of course, architecture and civic design and all kinds of different angles of what design means. And then broadly speaking, Kickstarter is, of course, uh, you know, it's a platform for creative projects. Really the base mission for every creative, for every Kickstarter project is to create something to share with others. So already baked into that idea is the idea of building an audience, those others who you're sharing something with. And of course, our definition of creativity is quite expansive. So we have 15 different categories, and that's everything from art and music and film to things like food and journalism and design and tech. And over the six years that Kickstarter has you know, been, been doing what we do, uh, we have been honored to have 85,000 projects that have successfully funded. And that represents over $1.7 billion pledged across the site. And you know, the people who have, of course, made that possible are the creators, people who are bringing exciting ideas, but more than anything, the backers, people who have come out and supported these creative projects. And to date, there's over 8.6 million backers. And significantly, about a third of those, 2.6 million of them, are repeat backers. So these are people who, you know, came to the platform because they were excited about a particular band or they wanted to see a particular film get made or they liked a type of product that was being launched. But they've stuck around and they've just sort of become fans of Kickstarter in general. They are our audience that we've built, um, people who are excited about supporting creative projects in this way. And of course, that, that impacts the platform in a lot of different ways, um, you know, perhaps most significantly financially. 60% uh, of the dollars pledged across the site are from this community of repeat backers, so people who keep coming back and supporting campaigns. And the audience is truly global at this point. Um, we, just this past week, we launched to creators in Germany and France uh, for the first time, so that was really exciting. Um, but already, backers have come from almost every country on Earth. That's all seven continents, including Antarctica. Um, so there's somebody sitting there in a, the barren wasteland, browsing the internet and backing Kickstarter campaigns, which makes some sense. Um, and then, you know, we also think about what is our impact on culture? And, you know, aside from these numbers, you know, how are these projects that are funded on Kickstarter getting out into the world and just being, you know, influential within their respective disciplines? So, for example, um, you know, seven Kickstarter-funded films have been nominated for Academy Awards, and in 2013, one took home an Oscar. And then design and art projects that have been funded through Kickstarter have been showcased in some of the, you know, the major institutions throughout the world, so the MoMA, the Whitney, the Smithsonian. And then within design, um, you know, we've done partnerships with places like the MoMA Design Store. So we've curated two different selections of product designs that have gone on to be, in many cases, bestsellers with MoMA Design. So in this case, the Three Doodler, which sort of invented the 3D printing pen, is tremendously popular with the MoMA Design Store crowd. But you know, sometimes the audience you're building is, is not a global one. Sometimes it's very local. So people have launched restaurants and movie theaters, maker spaces, museums for their local communities, really galvanizing support for a project among the people who are going to be best positioned to experience it. Um, that's really exciting to see. So this is a map of some of those places. Um, but of course, we also, our influence extends well beyond just the US and even the planet. Um, at least a dozen Kickstarter campaigns have actually been launched into space. So we have a whole category devoted to space exploration within technology, actually. So that's always a fun thing to check out. There's a really, really cool project up right now called LightSail that uh, Bill Nye is behind. Very much worth checking out. So just briefly, how does it work? What is the basic kind of mechanism for it? You're probably, for the most part, familiar with this. But um, you know, the basic way that you structure your campaign is you set 
a duration of time, and you set a funding goal. And if you're able to hit that goal during that time, then the project is funded, and you go on and make the thing and share it with people. And if for whatever reason it doesn't hit that goal, then no money changes hands. So there's no fee that's charged for creators, and the backers, the people who supported the project, aren't charged either. And this is what we call all or nothing funding. And, and really, for, for us, it's the best model um, for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, it just minimizes risk for everyone involved. So as a creator, you're not being asked to fulfill on a project that hasn't received the financial resources that it needs to move forward. And as a backer, you, know, you're not, you haven't supported something that ultimately isn't going to be able to you know, succeed and produce what you had backed for. But more than that, and perhaps most significantly for the topic tonight of audience development, it's just really exciting. It's, it creates this sense of drama. It's a sense of you know, narrative. It's an opportunity to have this 30-day period, or however long the campaign is, where you have this sustained engagement to keep telling your story with this audience and have this clear deadline, and really engage them and ask them to help you support this project at this moment. And you know, we're pleased to say that 40% of all projects reach their funding goal. Um, so when you think about it, that's actually quite remarkable, given that at any given moment, there's seven to 8,000 projects that are live on the site um, at this point. But if we drill down a little bit further with that, um, if you look at, look at it more closely, 17% of those unsuccessful projects don't even get a single pledge. So those are projects that somebody put up there and essentially didn't tell anyone about, didn't do any of the kind of audience development that we're discussing tonight in advance, and, and didn't really promote the project. So really, the success rates we can think about for projects that have really made a good faith effort to put it out there are a good bit higher. And in thinking about what is that audience that we need to kind of kick off this project, um, our data shows that 79% of projects that reach more than 20% of their funding goal go on to successfully fund. So we think of this phenomenon as the tipping point. So again, interesting information to keep in mind as you're kind of building that audience before you launch the campaign and you think about what are the group of people who are going to ultimately help me succeed with this. Now just in terms of the size of projects, Obviously, many of the ones you hear about with the press are the multi-million dollar blockbusters. Um, but it's important to know that the majority of projects on Kickstarter are between one and $10,000. And for us, this is actually great news. It's really exciting. Um, it's a really good indicator of sort of the health of the ecosystem that the majority of projects are smaller, and they're building much smaller communities. It's something that's much more achievable than going out and launching the next million dollar campaign. So taking a look at the design category, um, you know, we have over uh, 4,700 successful projects that have been funded. And that represents um, over $290 million pledged. And within that, that category, the community of backers is 1.5 million and growing. Average funding goal for design is $15,000. And the average raise is uh, 55,000. So it's a little bit higher than you know, what I said was the kind of most common range across the site which makes sense given you know, a lot of these are product design, but, but still it's not something that's astronomically high. Um, but you know, on, the, on the side of projects that do go on to raise a significant amount of money, um, over 450 have raised more than $100,000 just within the design category. So quite a bit of success there. And fundamentally, every Kickstarter project is a story that you tell to engage an audience in a creative project. But what the best campaigns are able to do is not only engage that audience, but also Ask them to tell that story on your behalf. So not just come and support the campaign, but spread the word. Tell other people about why this is exciting and kind of broadcast a lot of the same enthusiasm that you as a creator are broadcasting about what you're making. Now, the basic thing that you have as a tool to do this is, of course, your Kickstarter campaign page and the various aspects of that, the video, the project description. The rewards are, of course, very important as far as engaging an audience. And then the project updates. So this is sort of the ongoing log of how you're communicating with your backers, both during the campaign and also quite significantly after the campaign, how you're keeping in the loop about how the project's progressing. Then, then external to that, you know, the way that you're getting people to look at that campaign page and hopefully back the project, there's a whole slate of other tools. So email lists and social media, press, and then anything and everything that you can think of to creatively engage people. So in-person events, doing live demos. And this is a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight with our panelists. Like, what, what, what did they do? How did they get eyes on that campaign page? But you know, as you're thinking about the campaign, and just even kind of in the earliest stages, the two things to keep in mind are, what is the story that you're telling about the thing you're making? And who is the audience that you're hoping to engage? And this is, of course, um, a two-way street. So the story you're telling will, of course, be influenced by the audience you're hoping to reach, and then vice versa. But fundamentally, in thinking about those things, think about what is your underlying goal here? What are you hoping to achieve by 
successfully funding your campaign. Success means different things to different creators on Kickstarter. Some, some campaigns are simply there because they want to see something exist in the world. They just want to create it and have it be out there and then they'll move on to something else. Some are hoping to, they've had this thing they've been working on forever um, in their lab or their workshop and they're finally getting it out to an audience. So it's essentially your beta testers, your first group of users. And then for, for some campaigns, you're really wanting to test the validity of your idea as a business. So it's market validation. It's finding out, does this have commercial potential even beyond the campaign? So all of these are reasons why people launch Kickstarter campaigns. Think about what you want to do and think about what the story is you need to tell to reach the people who can help you do that. So now I'd just like to, to walk through a few notable Kickstarter campaigns here and think about them just from this angle of kind of story and audience and what they've done. So this is a really beautiful design project from earlier this year, the New York City uh, Transit Authority Standards Manual. So this is um, actually a reprint, a recreation of the manual that dictates all the design guidelines for the signage within the subway. So of course, thinking about this audience, it's of course design aficionados and graphic designers, people who are probably already quite familiar with kind of this legendary work. But also, you know, a lot of their campaign was also directed towards people who are fans of New York City history and people who maybe walk past these kind of masterpieces of subtle design every day on the subway but haven't thought about, this was all the thinking that went into it um, and telling that story. This is a campaign that just funded the Thames Baths. It's a project to bring a public swimming pool to the Thames River in London. So this is, you know, as I said, some campaigns are really focusing on a local audience. Um, in this case, the local audience is the city of London, so it's still quite a large one. But um, the story they're telling um, is really imagine what it would be like if you could jump in the river and go for a, a pleasant swim. Um, you know, it's, it's something that people haven't been thinking about. The river as this natural resource as actually something that could bring life to the city in that way. So that's the story they told. Of course, Pebble um, made headlines earlier this year with their, their second campaign. Um, and you know, their first campaign had a very different story and a very different audience that they were speaking to. Um, with their first campaign, they were essentially telling the world, there is this thing called the smartwatch, and you might want one, because it's going to do all these things. With their second campaign, it's really more a story of, of audience engagement. So they had built up this incredible fan base already on Kickstarter. Their core community was the Kickstarter community. So launching their second version was an opportunity to not just have it appear on store shelves one day, but to really have that sustained engagement, have a conversation with all these people who had sort of already identified themselves as their super fans, and really get it out there in a much more dynamic way. And then sometimes, Projects are an invitation to further creativity. So this is a project called Neo Lucida, which is a, a modernized, kind of updated version of the camera Lucida, this um, Renaissance era drawing technology. So this was made by a couple of artists. And really, their goal with this was to say to the artistic community that they were part of and beyond, this is a tool that we think is really interesting and really interesting in the context of technology and art. And we invite you to use it and see what you make with it. Um, so that's cool for us to see. And then. With product design in particular, a lot of the story that you want to think about is what is the story of this product being created? You know, when you walk into a store, you don't see all those behind the scenes documentation of this is the prototyping process or this is how something actually gets manufactured and gets put on that store shelf. So this project, Polygon, did a particularly beautiful job of you know, demonstrating not only this is our very beautiful product, so it's this very cool folding metal animal sculpture, but this whole parade of prototypes that led to that and inviting people into that stage of the process. And then finally, um, so this is a project that just launched as part of our German launch a couple of weeks ago, a um, project called Mito, um, which is sort of a reimagining of the electric kettle. Um, so taking the electric kettle and sort of inverting it so that it can, it can be this wand that only heats the amount of water you need for a single serving. And of course, there's a story to tell there about a beautiful design process and connoisseurship of tea and just kind of that ritual. But the thing that they really focused on, and the thing that when you go to their campaign page, the thing that's first and foremost is this quote talking about how the extra energy used from overfilling electric kettles is enough to light the streets of England for a night. So this was their sort of motivation, um, thinking about energy conservation, water conservation, and what, what product could actually address this issue in a very subtle, easy, easy to approach way. And so that's the story that they told and kind of built the audience around. So, we, of course, are excited to hear about what you're working on. And if you're working on a campaign and would like to talk to somebody here at Kickstarter about it, um, you can write to design at kickstarter.com or really any of the categories at kickstarter.com to talk to somebody who specializes in that area. Um, and you know, with that, I'd like to invite our panelists up here and talk a little bit about audience engagement and kind of how they think about it.
Great. So um, I'll just ask everybody to introduce themselves here. So first, um, to my left is Jake Levine of Electric Objects. Cool. Hi. Um, so uh, I launched a campaign about a year ago. Um, it was for a company that I was starting called Electric Objects and the introduction of our first product, um, EO1, which is a computer designed for art. Um, it's, uh, it's a screen that hangs on your wall in your home and brings artwork from the internet um, into your home. Uh, it's connected to, um, as you see here as an example, uh, a collection of um, original artwork that we're going out and commissioning from artists that we love and that we think you'll love too. Um, and uh, it's a way for you to engage around that um, art with a community of fans that, um, that appreciate it. So you see what other people are displaying, you see what um, uh, the sort of your network becomes a way for you to discover new art, which is in general the way that people have always discovered new art. And so that was the first project that we did um, about a year ago. It was successfully funded. Um, we raised uh, about $800,000 um, uh, within that 30-day period. And then um, we followed up uh, last month, or a few weeks ago actually, with this campaign called the $5 Commission. Um, and this was not a hardware project. This was a way for us to show people uh, exactly how the art made its way into electric objects, which was um, you find people who you think are interesting and doing really creative, um, fascinating work. Um, you fund that work and you give them like an interesting data set or an interesting theme um, from which to work from and, and they produce art uh, sort of on your behalf. So this was, this was um, uh, playing with a few ideas, um, both sort of exploring the way that art makes its way into electric objects, but also um, re rethinking what it meant to commission art um, so commission is typically done by a very wealthy person or institution um, uh, and is typically made available just to them. Um, the idea here was let's commission it uh, with thousands of people who each pay $5 um, and let's have the work itself be informed by the data from those backers. And so um, uh, these, we partnered with these four artists to pull it off. Um, we raised um, $7,000 for this campaign. We split it between the four artists. Uh, we, took, um, we actually contributed another 2000 on top of that. Um, and uh, we'll be premiering that actually in this building on June 15th or 16th um, with, uh, on the electric objects displays. Um, so that's it. Great. And uh, next we have, oh, <laughs> getting ahead of ourselves here. We have uh, Juan Hoyos of uh, Lumography. And Lomography, and uh, you guys actually just launched a campaign this yeah, morning so, too, right? <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Juan Ojos, or Antonio Castello, as I like to call myself. Uh, I'm a graphic designer and photographer, but I'm working actually uh, with Lomography on the marketing team. I do marketing for Canada and North America. And yeah, with this morning we launched our new uh, campaign. It's the fourth campaign we did. It's a new petrol lens. This is basically an analog lens that works for digital and analog cameras. Uh, the campaign has been really successful. We have all of our campaigns has been really successful. Actually, I think they're in the top of the successful <laughs> campaigns <laughs> because uh, there. I mean, we reach a lot of uh, people all over the world. We're a international company and international community, and we have many backers all over the world. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, everything's about analog photography in Lomography. We have a very strong community that is on pro of doing analog uh, photography, and it's on pro of shooting just analog products. So each time we try to do a new product, each time we do a campaign, we know that our niche, it's very small in the photography community. So this is, uh, this is something that it can be hard, but at the same time, it's something that is fun because we're reaching for people that is also in the digital world. So it's kind of a bridge between the digital and the analog world. Great, thank you. And finally, we have uh, Heather Delaney of Dynamo PR. And when, when, when somebody asked before how many projects you'd worked on, um, you, you, you had to think for quite a while. Yeah, um, I'm, there's, there's been a lot. I'm not even quite sure anymore. <laughs> These are just a small sampling of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I work in a PR agency, and I've launched anything from 3D printing pens, actually 3Doodler, the, the first one, and the second one, but the first one's the first Kickstarter I ever worked on, which was quite a learning curve, um, and it raised about 2.3 million in the end. Um, but anything from 3D printers to films and software and hardware. Um, essentially anything that I want to buy myself, I'm going to want to work on. 
Um, but the campaigns are absolutely global. Um, we have projects that are based in Tokyo, projects that are based in Australia and the US. Um, we've got Fove actually that's live right now, which is amazing. It's, it's VR um, with some eye tracking into it as well. Um, but with each, each campaign, you end up learning a lot. If you have one Kickstarter campaign, it's quite a learning curve. If you have 20, if you have 30, each and every one, you learn something new. You learn where the communities are lying, where, where your potential backers, what publications could potentially bring you $30,000 worth of investment. So, yeah. This is also Heather's first time in New York. And today is her first day in Brooklyn, <laughs> so that deserves a round of applause, I think. Obviously, there's no, no better introduction to Brooklyn than Kickstarter. So. I know, I know. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Great. So, so, you know, so pleased to have you all here and excited to talk about this. And, you know, we'll have some time also from questions from the audience as well at the end here. So definitely think about what you'd like to ask. Um, I'd like to pick up, just to start off with, though, you know, with what you were talking about, Juan, and saying, like, yeah, you, you do have this very specific audience, so people who are into analog photography. And when you're making something that is that specific as far as how do we find these people that are going to care about this very, in some cases, niche idea, how do you begin to think about that? How do you research, first of all, who's going to care about your idea? And then how do you find those people and how to communicate with them? Well, we have a big community already. We've been, we are not a company. Um, we like to think and we know that we are a community first than a company. Lomography started 25 years ago as a, as a community of fellow photographers who were into shooting photos every single day. So because of the iPhone, everyone shoots a photo all the time. We shoot pictures since we wake up till we go back to bed, right? But 20 years ago, this was not like that. 20 years ago, people used to take pictures only during birthdays or Christmas or special occasions, right? So we start to build a community from the first beginning. And I think this is what everyone should uh, do. And this is how real uh, companies are found. And that's how things started. If we think in Apple, which is a company I like very much, and it's a really big company and it's the best value brand in the market today, there I start uh, this. I remember that before Apple was so big, it was a lot of people who used to love Apple, right? It was like fans. It was these people who really love this. And these people is the one to tell you what to do next, where to go. Um, and this is what we take always. We always listen to our community. They're always telling us what they want uh, in the future, what is the product that they want to see, what is what they're needing. There's a lot of people who is, for example, Leica users, and they write comments on our website, and they say, we need a, a lens for Leica. There's not enough kind of these kind of lenses for Leica. There are these kind of lenses, but there is not this kind of. There are these cameras, but we're missing these. So it's everything is about listening. I like to think that um, companies um, today, what they need to do is always listen to the customer one to one. It's a communication that is one to one communication. And everything is based on customer service, basically. It's like a big customer service, what you're doing all the time. But at the same time, people don't know what they, what they want. I remember Steve Jobs used to tell all the time, people don't know what they want. You need to tell them what they want. So uh, nobody think of the iPhone before Steve Jobs did. Nobody thought of the iPad before Steve Jobs did. I mean, uh, like in the movies, you can see these kind of things, right? But customers, they never think of this. And this is what you need to aim, something that the customers want and something that they don't know yet what they want. So for example, this is what happened with the Petrol lens. The Petzval lens is a lens that is 2,800 years old, 175 years to be exact. And people, it's in love with this lens for so many years, but they, they didn't thought that it was possible to bring it back to, to reality, to put it on a Canon camera, on an Icon camera. So I think it's that. It's just to listen what the customer wants. It's also to have a little vision and then put two things together. One thing that we like to do is always be on Kickstarter. We are um, very supports with other Kickstarter uh, campaigns. And we are always studying what other companies are doing, what the customers are commenting on in these campaigns. And that's the way you can tell what they want and what you should aim to do. Like the case you just mentioned with the, um, the TED Talk, where this girl was talking about the, all the energy that this cutter needs, and then they have the idea. 
So this is, this is what you need to do. You need to listen what the people want, and you need to come with idea and to aim for that. Absolutely. And so, so, so Jake, I mean, as, as one was saying, sometimes people don't know that they want this thing you're creating. And in your case, you know, this physical object that displays digital art was in some ways a very new idea for a lot of people. How did you go about first communicating that this is something exciting and then finding the people who would care about it? Yeah, it's super weird. Um, I was on the phone with a guy who this morning who worked on the original iPod team, and he was saying, like, you have a particular problem, which is that, like, we had the Walkman. Like, the iPod had the Walkman, and um, what do you, you have, like, maybe, you have digital photo frames, which are, like, <laughs> the, 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 the laughing stock of the technology industry. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, it, we didn't really have a reference, and we didn't have a way to describe the product. Um, uh, we had to show people, I think, um, and so the video was very important. Um, but also, we had to, we had to sort of, um, in some ways, gloss over the details, because um, I think peop what people were buying Yes, it was the product, um, and the price was important in thinking about sort of their just their income and sort of how it fits into their home decor budget. But but they were buying a mission um, to like bring the internet into their lives in a way that didn't make them feel like shit. Like that was the like the 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 call to action, and it started way before the Kickstarter when I started talking about the project and almost in the terms of like a, an experiment, like an art project. Like you know, can we build a computer that doesn't fill us with anxiety, that doesn't make us feel overwhelmed with the amount of information that it's pouring out um, into, uh, into our lives? Can we build a computer that lives up to the beauty that we all know is in, inside of the internet? Um, and so that, that message, um, <clears throat> the first, you know, the opening line of the video is not about like check out these cool tech specs um, and like let me tell you about like the surface coding on the screen. It was like let's talk about how we all love the internet and how we think it's this source of beauty. And, um, and why can't we have it, you know, in our lives in a way that doesn't fill us with anxiety and dread? Um, so um, I guess that's a that's a long way of saying like it depends on the product. I think in many ways, and it's certainly different if you're at, like all sort of marketing challenges and community building challenges. It's different depending on what you're trying to get people to fund. But in our case, when, you know, building a hardware project that didn't have a lot of reference points, trying to create something new. Um, you had to get people to, to sort of buy into and believe in uh, uh, something greater than a particular piece of, of hardware. Right, yeah, yeah, and it really comes through. I mean, the fact that you could show that incredible array of artwork as part of the campaign shows that there's already amazing content for this. Yeah, this I mean, the community is like, I mean, unlike the iPod, for which there is this incredible, uh, you know, trove of, of, of content locked inside these massive, like four or five music publishers, um, the artists that are creating work for electric objects are already like they're they're way ahead of the technology industry. They're giving their work away for free on Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter and on their websites, and because they just want to share what they're creating. So we have an advantage over the iPod, which is that we're not we don't have to go strike deals with Warner Music. Um, but yeah, generally like that community is there and they're waiting for this product, and so and so sort of uh, tapping into that was important. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and then Heather, I mean, I know you said that the first campaign you worked on was actually the, the, that first three doodler. Um, and this strikes me as another example of um, a very really exciting project, but probably the first time somebody sees that, they're like, what, what is this thing? I don't quite know what it does. Like, how did you balance that kind of thrill of the new with inviting people in to have an experience that they knew they wanted? Yeah, it, it, three doodler was, it, it was very interesting. It's not very often that you're given access to a world's first. Um, it's just, it's, it's very, very uncommon. So it was bridging the gap of what is, what is this product? How do you compare it? Um, there were a lot of people comparing it to, say, a hot glue gun. Um, for those of you that don't know what 3 Doodler is, it's the world's first 3D printing pen. So essentially, you can stencil, just like a 3D printer, layer upon layer, or you can actually draw up and start to draw a tree. You could draw a house. So similar to electric objects, it was showing people, giving them video, showing it to them in person, um, building the community. It didn't, it didn't have a community. There was, it didn't exist on Google. I remember Googling it ahead of time, and there was literally zero results, which, again, how often do you get that one? Um, so you're, you're finding out who potentially could use it. The 3D printing industry, it existed already. The crafting industry, it existed already. So 
sourcing those different areas and explaining it to them in a way that those divisions would understand. Excellent, yeah, and, and so, you know, as I mentioned, we, we have this phenomenon that we've sort of noted through our data of this tipping point of reaching 20% funding and then that being a very, very commonly leading to success. How do you, how do you think about that, that size of the audience you're developing in advance of the campaign? How do you know when the audience you've built is big enough? And how do you know if they're engaged enough? If they actually, if signing up for the emailing list actually means, yeah, I care about this enough to back the project. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, this is also, I mean, I don't think there's a, a single answer for this. Um, we, were a, we were a venture-backed company, and there were sort of some, like, we had, we had promises to our investors and our employees, and I mean, our employees, it was like three of us, but like, there was an expectation that this was, that it was going to be, that this could lead to a large business, and we had, we had signed up for that challenge and that ambition. Um, and so, uh, for us, like, setting our goal was was almost like a was like a PR strategy it was like we we need we know that when you know we need to be able to go to you know to the following 10 press outlets and and say if they don't write about us right out of the gate say or if they do do you know ask for a follow up post saying we you know we killed our goal and within 24 hours we doubled it or tripled it or quadrupled it cuz that's like a that's like an easy PR moment um, with a kickstarter campaign it's sort of an abuse of the system in some ways but um, but you hope that like you set it low enough so that the PR moment gets you to a place where you're actually you actually clear your goal and it's a risk but like so is venture capital and like that's sort of the game that we're in um, uh, so that's that's how I that's how I thought about it. And then there was like an actual minimum, like we actually can't go to production below this number, um, and that was kind of a guess, like based on you know because we were eight months out from actually finishing production, um, and uh, we guessed like okay, I would say. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. It's completely a risk, but that's what is fun. Um, we have our online shop, and we've been selling products for the last ten or fifteen years. And when we start with Kickstarter, we did it as well because we know that it's, it's a way to try it, right? You're actually just risking a lot of time, but you're not risking a lot of money. You're risking resources, but you're not, you don't have the product yet, right? So it's, it's a way you can risk yourself. It's a way you can just throw yourself into the water and see how people start to respond. And what I like of Kickstarter is that you can start to change your your project as well. It's, nothing, it's not that something that is right on stone. Uh, for example, for our last project, um, the instant camera, people start to comment, uh, I would love if this camera has a mirror in, in the front because I love uh, the selfies. And a lot of people start to say, yes, I agree with this guy, I agree with this guy. And we start to see that a lot of people really wanted the mirror, and we say, okay, let's do a mirror. And then we, we ask, okay, if you want a mirror, what color do you want the camera? And they start to say, I want it red, I want it blue, but a lot of people want it white. So we say, okay, then we do it white. So it's also a conversation. It's something that you start with something that you think this is what they want, but then they also tell you it will be better if, it is, 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 if it's like this. So it's, it's a conversation that is going and it's growing. And the same, the press also tell you what they want. Uh, the whole market drives you to the perfect product. So, the, so, so now by your fourth campaign, just by listening to the people who have backed the previous ones, you have a good sense of, oh, this will succeed now, or this will be popular. Definitely. Yeah. This is the second Pestval lens we launched. The first lens was 85 millimeters. And a lot of customers, a lot of people was telling, all, telling us all the time, this is uh, too close, this is for portraits only, I would love to use this lens for a street, I would love to have a wide angle lens. And the people tell us, this is what they want, so what, I mean, what else can you do if you don't give them what they want? This is perfect for your business. Yeah, and, and Heather, how do, how do you think about this? So when a startup comes to Dynamo and says, you know, we want to launch this campaign and we, we want ultimately to have this size of audience, how do you help them think about have you done enough kind of audience building in advance? And like, what are the tools and techniques that you use for that? So I th it's, it's completely dependent on the product itself. Um, there are some projects that have absolutely no experience whatsoever. They've, it's their first startup. It's a couple of guys in a basement. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do it, depending on who your audience base is. If you were a 3D printer, for instance, you would want to attend the maker events and get some feedback from that community. Let them know that you're building something new just for them. Start to generate some emails, because obviously that's the target audience. That's who you're going to be going after when your campaign's live. 
and they can give you some amazing feedback ahead of time. And they are, they are quite selective on what, what they're looking for. Where if you have more of a, a design-led product, if it's very fashion, you would want to go for more of the fashion events. And you can still do that in a way that doesn't generate a lot of coverage, that you're just targeting the audience itself. Because, and I've mentioned this before, but if you have a journalist write the article and you're three weeks out of launch, there's no reason for them to write at launch again. So you've just essentially lost that click. You've lost those potential backers because he's written the story already. There's no need to do it three weeks later. So you have to be quite clever in the community. Some, sometimes we launch things having been completely dark. Nobody was ever aware of it. Um, sometimes we have the community base behind it already. And once you have that community, you need to make sure that they're given access first. You warn them ahead of time. You send them an email. You don't want to spam them. But you, you let them know when the time is coming. You guys have believed in us enough that you've given us your, your private email address. On this day, on this time, we're going to be launching. We want you guys to be the first ones in there. Bring them into the fold. Yeah, there's also no way to like develop a product without talking to people, mm -hmm. um, right? And 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 putting it in front of them and getting them to use it and, and understanding their feedback and um, you know if you if you if you don't have a you know a few hundred people um, that are participating in your little experiment before launching, like you're you're gonna either describe it incorrectly or you're going to you know um, just miss some features that were really important or um, I, it's it's sort of the um, the good news is that like you you're gonna if you're doing a good job with product development you're gonna be building that audience anyways as a natural byproduct of it and if you're doing the product development and not building the audience then it, maybe there's something wrong with your product um, but at least you found that out before investing in a Kickstarter campaign um, and I think the like you know sort of I think we had like maybe a thousand people on an email list and a few hundred Twitter followers, and um, and we had I had like 50 people with the prototype of the product who were ready to talk about it. And so, um, but it was great marketing, and it I think contributed meaningfully to the success of the campaign. But it was also like that was just product development. That was understanding if anyone actually wanted it, um, which I think is as critical as like hitting your goal. Yeah, I think I mean there's there's you should definitely ask your friends and family. The one problem with friends and family is that they love you dearly. <laughs> and whatever your idea is, it is the best idea ever. And you are going to be so successful. If I asked my mother, you know, is my artwork going to make a lot of money? Of course, <laughs> I am the next Banksy. I am going to make millions. It's awful. I cannot draw. I would not make enough money. So you need to, to branch out from kind of that safety net of friends and family. Find people who potentially are the target audience that you're going after and actually ask them, ask for their honest opinion. Because they don't know you personally, they'll give their honest opinion. And the Kickstarter community is very, very unique. They will give their opinion as well. Because they, they want to build something with you. They know by the time you've launched, you want that feedback. And they want to give it. That product that's on the store shelves, I made that happen. I made it green. That's, that's my product now. I'm part of that company. So you need to be able to, to listen. Yeah, it's not difficult to like talk to a hundred people yeah. um, over the course of a couple months, a few months, and test the product. And if you can get those hundred people to say like, yeah, I would back this, then you know, or I'd buy this for this amount of money, or like I totally get what you're doing and I want this, and you start hearing from other people who aren't those people that they hear about it and want it, then um, jumping from that to say, yeah, I could probably do a thousand people on Kickstarter is is an easy jump. Um, but if you talk to 100 people and 95 of them are having trouble or like they're like trying to understand it but aren't, then like there's something wrong and you need to fix that before you take the leap um, into uh, you know to Kickstarter. Although there are plenty of projects that you know fail the first time and do well, like the cooler, which is like the maybe the old maybe it's an exception, but it did it, it's like proved that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just just to speak to that briefly, I mean, certainly part of his subsequent success was having building that community yeah. with the first campaign and hearing from them, yeah. this is what needs to change or this is did what you think fail, Did he fail the first campaign? He did, yeah. The coolest so cooler. this is the coolest cooler, yeah. which was like the biggest product of all time, right? Um, I mean, that's one way to do your product development <laughs> is like do it on Kickstarter uh, and figure out sort of what's resonating and what's not. And then the next time around, you know exactly what story is going to work. For us, for us, it's fun. It's very different. Um, our company is based on Vienna. Uh, Austria, and this is a city that it's gone through a lot of things. It's gone through 
two world wars. It's an imperial city that was, it's, it's a city that is really, really conservative and they're not used to the USA marketing. And for me, it's like a constant fight with the headquarters on how to do this uh, versus how not to do it. But of course, I'm just an employee, so they always have the right. And Lomography in Vienna, they're very, very top secret about everything. They never want to tell anything about what's going on. Um, the last product that we launched today, this was a really good big fight for me to tell the, the boss, let's do a press release three days before the, product, the product's launching so the press can have some time to prepare yeah. the communicate. And this was a really big fight until uh, I win somehow. Uh, because <laughs> in the last third campaigns, there was nothing about nothing, nothing. No one knows until the very last minute that we launch and then they talk about it. And then everyone's like, wait, 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 what, what's going on? You just launch a product just like that? Okay, <laughs> let me see what it is. So this is, this is completely the opposite way. And what I think it is the, the best way to do it is, is just um, to be very prepared about it. So Vienna doesn't like to do this is because they like to be very detailed. It's, as, as you were saying, you want to have everything prepared. You want to have everything ready. You want to have every single detail. And it's not like you just launch a product one day to another. We work on this for four or five months. And then the last day, we're still changing texts, uh, we're still changing images, we're still uh, thinking what is the way to communicate. And at the same time, you need to be prepared uh, of the customers because of this. Because you didn't tell the customers be before, because you didn't tell the press or the community before. Uh, you know that there's going to be a lot of questions. You know that there's going to be haters. There's always haters. Uh, there's always bad comments. There's always good comments. There's always everything. So you need to be very prepared. So what we like to do is uh, we have this Google Doc with all the questions, all the possible comments that we will have on this Kickstarter. So we're ready. So we have this policy that we will uh, answer any comment, any answer, minimal one hour. Uh, that's the time we have, the time frame we have. And we have people everywhere, so this is, this is 24 hours for us. We have people in Manila, we have people in... Uh, Hong Kong, we have people in Europe, we have people here, so it's 24 hours, so every customer in every single country can be, our, um, if they have a question, if they have a comment, we'll take care of them in, in one hour or so. So it's very important, um, I know that not everyone has people in Manila, people in Hong <laughs> Kong, but it's very important to be aware that this is going to happen, that you will have haters, that you will have answers, you will have stupid answers because there's people that doesn't know anything about your product and you think this is a stupid question. I know that's super easy, but it's not for them. It's just, yeah. it's just for you. Yeah, so, so let, let's talk about that. How do you sort of win over backers, not only to back your campaign, but as I was saying, to sort of spread the word for you, to be the person who's advocating for the project and bringing their networks and their friends and family to come check this out as well. Um, what techniques have you found are effective in kind of giving them the tools to go out and speak on your behalf? Um, Kickstarter is really good at that um, because of the emails that it sends out when people back the campaign and the idea that I mean that you know um, I was Heather Heather backed Electric Objects at a dollar which is great um, and hopefully she clicked the button that says like I just backed Electric Objects um, I, I think um, you know a, a, a computer made for art which 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 brings more people in I think that's the cheapest way to to buy you know a larger audience is that you you know create a, a, a sort of a low end pledge for that um, it totally pays off, especially if one of your friends ended up backing at two ninety nine or three ninety nine or whatever it was. Um, uh, so I think that's that's an important part of it. I think it's it's all comes back to like the mission, like what are you trying to do? And it, is what you're doing worthy of getting someone to try to bring their friends on board for it? And um, and it, it's not gonna be like I just bought this cool thing for myself. Right? It's no one wants to no one brags about like buying a new chair at West Elm, right? They they brag about participating in like a movement. Um, and so you need to, ideally you are a part of a movement and you're creating a movement, but you at least need to create a perception that like this is something bigger than all of us, than, than the campaign, than the company, than the people involved, than the backers. It's like only together can we do this thing. Um, and that, that, that's like, that comes through, like you don't actually want to say that because it sounds cheesy, but it comes through in the way that you, in the way that you talk about it and, and the passion that you show in the video and the text. And um, one of the things, you know, you mentioned haters, I always find like, I love calling people out 
because it's so easy to hate on electric objects because it's a company that has no face and it's like, you know, they don't know that it's just eight people in Manhattan trying their best to make something cool. And so if you just respond from your, you know, personal Twitter account or whatever and um, say, hey, actually, you know, that's not, that's not true. Like, we actually think about it this way or, you know, this is, you're misinformed, whatever. It's like so quickly that they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, really love what you're doing. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I, I love, I love just like, you just put the people first and, the, and talk about it in the context of this larger movement. I think that's how, that's how we sort of think about it. And Heather, how, how have you kind of helped campaigns reach that sort of viral spreading of the excitement? Oh, man, I could probably talk about this for a few hours. Um, there's a lot of preparation. I am almost military in the way that I work. It's what's your launch date, right? Working backwards from that. I will speak to press for three weeks under embargo. So they're not allowed to release any information. It gives them time to write the story. I mean, you'll be speaking to Forbes. That journalist has a day job. They have so many articles that they have to write about. Google's announcing things. Apple's announcing things. They have editors breathing down their neck. A little Kickstarter isn't on the top of that priority list. And not only one little Kickstarter, they'll have 100 emails from Kickstarters. So you have to be different, and you have to think quite quite carefully, because they're very, very busy. They might have 45 minutes to be given an article, you're going to write about that, figure out what it's about, draft it, edit it, and post it. That's not a lot of time. So three weeks, they can review everything. I have all the images. I have the contents done for the Kickstarter, the video. They can watch it. They can upload as much as they want. If they need interviews, fine. We've got plenty of time for that. So there's a lot of preparation before the campaign's actually gone live. Once you're live, articles are appearing, everyone's very happy, there's a lot of links, SEO value, wonderful, your website's doing great. But then they're social. There's people talking about VR, for instance. They love virtual reality. They love Oculus Rift. They might not be aware that Vove exists because it's only just launched. But you can see it on Twitter. You can do a quick search of, you know, digital screens or VR or 3D printers and see that the conversations are happening already. Jump into that conversation. I, I can see you're interested in 3D printers. The micro is live on, on Kickstarter right now. Here's, here's the link. Draw people in because obviously they want to know about you. They just don't know about you yet. So there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done ahead of time. Um, social is very, very important. Facebook, Twitter. Um, don't worry about Instagram for now. It's not really going to do a lot. Um, but it's about preparation. I think a lot, of, a lot of projects think that they can launch a campaign tomorrow. I'll just launch it tomorrow. I'll call a few journalists. They'll write about it. It'll be fine. Um, I'll tweet a couple of times. It's, it's not that easy. You know, I'll, I'll tell my friends and family. Usually, by that time, your friends and family have probably invested in your startup already. So you've bled them dry. You need to, you need to find some, some new people. So preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, so Juan, you just launched a campaign this morning. Can you, thinking of preparation, what was the time, time frame? Can you walk us through all the steps that led up to this? Yeah, sure. So um, as I tell before, our method is completely different to Heather. I would love if my boss let me talk with the press on embargo three weeks <laughs> Because, for example, they were pushing me a lot. Why is TechCrunch not talking about the Kickstarter? Well, today is the Google keynote. What can I do? I just sent the press release this morning. You didn't let me send it yesterday or two days ago. So this is this is a way. This is a better way. And I always having this fight, but we don't do it, right? So why is our way? So um, from the Pebble Watch. Uh, they're, they have the, a really good uh, strategy, and it's to tell the customers before. You, they already have a, a community build because they already have one first project. This is the second project. The community is the one that's going to be there. It doesn't matter if Forms doesn't talk about you. It doesn't matter if Time Magazine doesn't talk about you. Probably your customer doesn't even read the Time. Probably your customer doesn't even read the Wall Street Journal. They read, they, they probably doesn't even read newspapers. They're just... 
<laughs> you know, there's people for everything. There's people who read uh, Bloomberg. There's people who read uh, the New York Times. So it's it's not all about press. It's also about community. It's, as Heather says, it's a lot about Facebook, Twitter, and it's about telling them hand before. So we always uh, have these mystery product teasers, which is the way we engage with our community. And what we do is we start to give tips. So this always engages the community. So each day we have a new tip. So for example, uh, the lens was designed 175 years ago. So we say, uh, there, here are 10 things that happened 175 years ago. Can you imagine what is the new product we're launching in this particular date? Mm -hmm. so what Heather says is very important is to tell them what particular day you're launching your product so they're aware of this is going to happen. Uh, they don't know if you're going to launch it in your own website, if they, you're going to launch it on Kickstarter, if you're going to launch it in some, somewhere else. So it's very important to always bring you from, to your website and from your website to spread the word to all over the place. Newsletter is very important. Don't spam, don't spam but newsletter is very important. It's the most important thing for us is newsletter. And the way we get a newsletter is by reaching other communities. So we work a lot with uh, photography communities. We work with everyone who loves cameras. We are there. Um, we give cameras for free. We give product for free. We give whatever we can do. Uh, if we have a product that is not selling well, we just give it away in exchange for emails. So once you have your emails and once you have your people who you're going to send this newsletter, this is the way you go. The newsletter is, is super important. Um, as I was telling before, this is customer 101. You, hit, you need to hit your customer in the core. And there are customers that use Facebook. There are customers that use Twitter. There are all people that don't use any of these. But most of them have uh, email. Everyone has an email. And this is the way. The newsletter is super important for us. This is the way we start. This is the where we reach with new tips uh, that we taste them. We tell them in this date, particular day, there is a mystery product launching. And it's, it's all about teasing for us. And once you're there, once that you launch your product, uh, everyone's going to be talking about. And that's when, that's when the most hard part starts. And I guess this is something that is gonna, we're going to talk later. And it's once you launch, what is the next step? which is very important as well. Yeah, so, so that's perfect segue. What is the next step after you launch? How do you, how do you take that initial excitement? You know, hopefully you got some nice press pickup and you got that newsletter coming in and a lot of early backers, but how do you keep that interest going or how do you make sure that the campaign still feels exciting and fresh to people? I mean, I think it depends on what, you, what you're trying to do. If you, um, you know, we wanted to keep selling as much product as we wanted. Um, and we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, the, the, the most important thing for us is that the 2,600 people that are getting EO1 this month um, feel great about it and tell lots of people about it, right? And so how do you make sure that they feel great about it when, they, when it arrives? Well, um, it's not six months late. Um, and it meets the expectations that we set in the campaign. And um, the best thing you can do is reinforce those expectations over time. And if it is going to be a couple weeks late, like be extremely transparent about it. And, um, and so it's all, it all comes down to like, keeping your customers on your side, making them feel like they're part of what you're doing, um, and that they're not just like along for the ride. Um, and the other thing for us was, um, okay, we want to um, we want to make sure we're continuing to get pre-orders and that we're continuing to arm people with interesting things to talk about to um, to their friends so that they send them to electricobjects.com um, or to the Kickstarter campaign and they're directed uh, to you know to buy the, to reserve the product at electricobjects.com. And so it's you know we've been doing I've been doing a weekly email since we had like five prototype testers and now we have thousands and we do every week like here's a new like artist interview um, that we that we, we we love this artist we want you to see their work they're doing they're working with us they're going to be a part of the electric objects collection and we're giving you a sneak peek of their work so every week there's something new coming out so, so, um, and sharing those as updates as part of the campaign yeah, yeah. and so it's part of, it's there's we have an email list we have like Kickstarter updates which are actually when we often when we talk about like cool art things. That that we're doing on Kickstarter. Oops, excuse me. Um, uh, the angry hardware people come out and say, like, tell us about production. We don't like stop trying to distract us with <laughs> with art stuff um, because there's obviously like a there's a suspicion I think of hardware projects. So we knew that going into it, and we set very like conservative uh, milestones for ourselves. Um, 
Uh, anyways, long way of saying, like, I think we've sent like 25, 26 updates in the last eight months, um, and it's just, it's like easy. Like, we, there's tons of stuff that we're doing, and and we just have to tell people about it, and um, it, they generally find it, like, you'd be surprised at, at how interesting they find it, and they I mean, come these, up These to are you. people who have voluntarily basically said, we're your biggest fans, so yeah. they're excited about every And I don't know, can they unsubscribe from a particular project? Uh, we would never talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so they can't even unsubscribe. Um, uh, no, it's, it's, it's super important because um, they're your evangelists. They're your early adopters. And if you don't please them, then you're, never gonna, you're not going to be successful with anyone else. That's great. Uh, and so so we, we're going to go to audience questions soon. Um, but I wanted to just you know, round back to what you were talking about with press, Heather, and talk about so how do you get that elusive pickup from this overburdened reporter? How do you approach them in a way that does make your project stand out? And and in the campaigns you've worked with, what have been the most effective types of press coverage? What have really driven you know, interest yeah. in the campaign? Um, well, obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm in a PR consultancy. So I will already have had the contacts. I know the journalists. Some of them, I, I know their mothers and their, their brothers and their, and their family. So it's quite easy for me. If it's your project, it's your first Kickstarter, you've never done this before, you need to give them time. For me, they have my email address already. I'm not going to be filtered out. They, they don't know your email address exists. So it's worth doing a search online. Who are your competitors? Where have your competitors been written about? Who in that publication actually wrote about it? Was it John Biggs? Was it you know a, a particular journalist was writing about VR? Great. They're already interested in what you do. Are they, are they still writing about it? Was it just a one-off five years ago? OK, then they're not interested right now. So it takes a lot of research and give them time. Three weeks, ideally, is perfect because they can find your email. They'll, they'll go through all of their current stuff. Once a week, they'll probably take a look at their filtered folders, see in the subject what's going on. If you have a rambling email that's six, eight, 12 paragraphs, they'll bin it. They don't even care because they have so little time. You keep it very short, you keep it very sweet. Ideally, bullet points. Bullet points are great. Now, that's, that's probably the best advice I could possibly give you. Do the research, keep it short, short and sweet. Even the subject, short and sweet. It shouldn't be, we've got a very exciting VR headset that is gonna change the world, blah, 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 and it looks great too. Nobody's going to read that. The good news about um, the good news about uh, the tech press and the media press and um, general any trade press is that they they have to they have to write like five articles a day, um, and so they're looking for like you basically just write their article for them and then they like put a headline on it and their byline and like if you if you can give them if you can hand them the story so they have to do very little work, um, you know they'll write about you. Tech TechCrunch is like. Um, you know, unless they're covering the Google Keynote. It's like generally, like if you're launching a new product, they'll cover it. Um, the flip side of that is it's actually not that valuable to you. I think what's valuable is a perception of a lot of press. Um, it lends credibility to a project. It creates like a little bit of buzz. People like hear about it for the second or third time, and then by the time their friend mentions it, they come to your site and they, and they, and they back it. Um, and so it's, it's a bit of a... Um, I don't know. It's a bit of a red herring. I think people people often often come to us and say like, "You guys did so well. You you know you got so much press." And I was like, "Well, you know, press was like seven percent of our of our referral you know pledge, um, or some you know tiny number like that. It really m had more to do with like the organic sort of demand that we were driving um, from our own efforts and um, and from the Kickstarter sort of social mechanics, which are which are critical as well." Um, in Kickstarter promotion, which which was a uh, maybe twenty or thirty percent of of the overall pledge amounts. But I, I like what you say before. Um, if you don't have any press contact like Heather, if you don't in touch with press, what you what you told about artists is very important for us. Um, the artists as is part of our core. We call actually we call them Lomo Amigos, which mm -hmm. is French in Spanish, and these people is the one that is is the voice of your company because your company doesn't have a face. Your company is just a bunch of people working there. It's just a logo and doesn't have a, a, a face, right? So what we do is when we're launching a product uh, one month ahead, two months ahead before launching the product, we, with, we give the product to different people. They can try the product. They can play with it. They can build some content. 
and you tell them this is top secret, please don't discuss it with anyone. But once the, the campaign is on air, you can do whatever you want. Please do whatever you want. <laughs> and once the campaign is there, you just go to Facebook and you start to see these drivers and they have a lot of followers. You want to work with people who is, they're just friends. There is, it doesn't have to be super famous people. It's just friends that they also have followers and fans and they will talk about your product because they already like it, they already try it. So they start to say, I have the opportunity to play with this product and now it's a reality, just take a look. And it's people who is talking for you, it's doing your work and they enjoy it and they'll feel very proud of helping yeah. you, right? And if it's not a product like a lens or the digital frame, but it's, I don't know if you're doing a, a, a book of your photography or if you're doing your own product, just let peop other people try it. Just let it, other people play with it and make them feel part of your project. This is, they have to be, uh, they have to feel part of this project too. It's not, it's not only you. This is, if you're gonna sell it to a lot of people, then a lot of people also have to be proud of it and they have to believe on it. I think, I mean, that's, that's a really great point. So, I mean, one thing to do is, is that press are pitched so many so many projects and so many stories, whether it's crowdfunding or not. So give them, give them something unique. If you have a 3D printer, 3D print their logo because that gives them creative content that they can either photograph or put in a video that makes their article just a bit different from everybody else. Um, 3 Doodler, we actually doodled um, the, the Twitter images of different press and then we made a video of it. We gave that to the journalists because they had something interesting that was geared just to them and then you know had had one sent in the post as kind of a, a surprise I know one of them actually still has a picture of himself on his desk mm -hmm. um, but keep it creative I mean there's certain publications depending on the type of product that you have that we know can drive thirty thousand dollars worth of investment I know that if you're on co-design and you happen to be on flipboard that could crash a website CNET can crash a website so what could that do for a, a Kickstarter campaign? Engadget, tens of thousands of dollars can be funded just from Engadget. But then if the journalist has written the article, let them know. That's information that you as a project creator has on the back end. I can see that $45,000 and five cents is from this one article and this one publication. Thank the journalist, they are people as well. But tell them, say, your article has driven this many backers. That's, you know, thank you very much. They're gonna to wanna to continue to write the story as you were saying earlier. Their readers are obviously your community and your backers and they wanna hear the storyline of how your campaign's doing. You've reached your goal, you've doubled your goal, you've come out with stretch goals, the community is changing the product completely and then you know, you've reached five million and you're the most successful sweater company in the world. Um, but let them know. You, you have the opportunity to. So almost treating them as collaborators or partners and yeah. kind of creating this thing, yeah. And actually some of them might end up being your backers as yeah, well. For yeah, for sure. Actually you need to tell them, hey, this, remember, this Thursday is the kickstart, no? <laughs> Get your wallet. <laughs> All right, this is great. So, so at this point, I would love to open it up to questions that you have. There's um, some microphones in the audience here, so please just raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and they'll come find you. Um, I was just wondering if there's a difference in how you approach um, these more news journalists, I would call them, versus, um, like, I'm sort of more fashion, and in my world, a lot of times, I feel like a lifestyle blogger is more important to my purchase decision than me reading about something in, like, the New York Times or something like that. So I was just curious if you ever have any differences in how you post approach these lifestyle bloggers and also with both the news journalists and lifestyle people, whether it's a magazine or a blogger or whatever, if you track um, their traffic and also if you ever do anything like give them a special code um, or just anything that like sort of tracks the traffic, especially if it's like offline media or something. Well, I mean, I'll work with fashion press and tech press and mummy bloggers and food and nationals, each of them are completely different in the type of story that they're looking for because their readers are, in, in every way, they're completely different. So you could have an Android-based computer for kids. The tech press want the specs. They want to know why is that different. The mummy blogger wants to know that it's easy. I can turn it on, 
my child is, you know, segregated into only this much work that he can do until he finishes his homework and then he can play his games. It's, it is very different. So you need to take a look. And every product has a huge array of the press that you're going after. There's different strings to a campaign. So if you were a sweater company, it's not just the fashion press that you're going after. You're also talking to the national press and saying, you know, it's a, it's a small US startup that's trying to reshore business over here and we're not going to have the, the sweaters made in China. We're making it in the US. We're starting jobs. So you have that side of the story. You have the fashion story in that, you know, it's the new Pentatone colors and it's, it's all about masala. So they're masala jumpers, which apparently is actually a thing right now. But then you have the mummy bloggers and you have, you know, it's, it's winter gear because it's a sweater. So each of them is, is quite specific in a totally different area of the story that you're telling because they don't care about the tech specs. They don't care about the fashion press, usually unless they're a feature journalist and they're really delving deep into the industry. They don't really want to bother with the production line and how that's going. But if you happen to have a fashion product right now, talk about how you're bringing business into the local area. First of all, the local press will want to talk about it because you're a local story and you're, you're one of us. The national press will want to talk about it because, again, you're a local story building it up and it's a good example of how a business is kind of, a, it's the, the David versus Goliath story. It's you against Michael Kors. Hi. Um, what's your opinion on campaign length and um, keeping engagement up in terms of that? Campaign what? Length. Campaign length. Yeah. I know Kickstarter um, recommends 30 days. Yeah. I just want to know your thoughts. Um, I did a 30-day one with, with Electric Objects, the big one, and then, and then the, um, the $5 commission was like four days. Um, Monday, I think it, we launched it on a Monday, and we were like, well, we should probably end it on like a Thursday um, and not a Friday, because Friday is like a bad news day um, and just a bad day for traffic. Um, and so uh, we did a four-day campaign because, um, I don't know, it was, like, it was like a weird, it was a weird campaign. It was going to use the data. We were going to ask the backers questions in the survey, and then we were going to use that survey data to make art about them. So it was like, it was a very non-traditional campaign, um, but we also thought that, you know, like we know exactly who we're targeting with this. We're not trying to get like, you know, weeks of press out of it. We think we can get one press bump on, you know, the day after the campaign, and that's good. That's enough. Like, there, there's not going to be, there's no follow on story here. Um, and so it was a lot less work um, to do a four day campaign. Um, and uh, I think we had, you know, almost the same number of backers, but they were pledging at $5 and not $299. And um, it was a very different, um, it's just different goals, different goals for it. I think, I think 30 days is like a good standard. It, the, the, the way to think about it is like how the story evolves over, those 30 day uh, over that 30 day period um, and how, what the pace of your sort of word of mouth um, is. And, and Heather might have some better data on this having done 30 or 40 campaigns. Um, but generally, I think like you want to you know, you know that like, okay, in week two, this is the story. In week three, this is the story. And here's, we're going to announce something new. And then in week four, like, it's driving everyone to the close, trying to get as much press as you can possibly, like making sure that all the reporters who are about to write like, get their story in before the end of it. I don't know. Do you have other, other thoughts think, on it? I think in terms of the length, 30 days is, is very, very good. 45 days, I've, I've done anything from, from 20 days to, to 45 days, 50 days. Um, once you're going into 60 days, the problem is, as a first-time backer or just a backer in general, I'll click over to your Kickstarter page and say, oh, yeah, it's pretty good. Oh, it's got you know, another 57 days. I'll come back later. They likely won't come back later. You have to have as, as few links and clicks as possible. And if they click on you and take a look and like you, they're, they're not going to come back. You want to have that almost Black Friday sales mentality, get it now before it sells out or get it now before it's no longer available. So I, I quite find 30 days is a sweet spot. Um, if you want an extended campaign, I'm seeing a lot more 45 days coming in. But give it a reason to have 45 days. I mean, just as you were saying, make sure that you've, you've got a strategy for each week. What's the news? What, what are they getting out of it? There has to be 45 days. Is there you know, a new stretch goal that's been released or suddenly colors you're asking the community for? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's very interesting. 
Uh, our last three campaigns we founded on the first day. So actually, the 30 days is actually a lot of time. But we, we play with this. We play with the rewards. And we always say, if we reach, OK, so 100,000 is the goal. But if we reach 200,000, we will give everyone something else. And if we reach 3, 300,000, we with something else. And you're always building a story. You, the marketing is about building stories. It's about telling stories. And if you don't have a, a story to tell in 45 days, then don't do it. But if you have a story that is just for five days, then just go for five days. I think one thing to consider is that during your Kickstarter campaign, if it's 30 days, it's the longest 30 days of your entire life. Because every backer comment, question, suggestion, <laughs> even if it's just, hey, guys, like what you're doing, respond to them individually. And you could have thousands of comments. And then you have a day job on top of it. So if it's a 60-day campaign, that is that's a lot of time in front of a computer. Uh, Heather. Um, How much does it cost to engage your services? It, it kind of depends. So I mean, we have a full consulting service where you've got a team behind it. If a company wants social media, then we've got a social media team. Sometimes they prefer to do social media internally. And we're, I'm happy to train them on social. Look, you've got an intern, and you have your wife who's doing it. This is what she needs to do. These are the keywords she needs to go after. Here's the type of strategy that she needs to apply before it's launched, during, and after. Um, consulting on the side as well. Um, some projects are only looking for $5,000 worth of investment, in which case it's more likely that they can do it themselves. So I will, I will train you how to do it. And I've had campaigns that have launched crowdfunding campaigns where they were unsuccessful. And they were just a bit nervous. So instead, consulted with them for, say, 10 hours and trained them how to deal with press. Who should they be targeting? The messaging of the page, the messaging of the, the press release. Are your images correct? Is your video correct? You're Here's them over the phone? Phone, Skype. If they're in Tokyo, it'll probably be Skype. And you know, I'd love to go, but I can't <laughs> afford it. In person, it's depending on where they are. I mean, the, the projects I've worked with are Australia, Asia, US. All over. Do you have, is there anything pro bono? Or like, if the idea is so great, do you ever take I anything on? I, this right here is pro bono, right? I, I actually do all the time. I just don't tell anybody. So we can discuss that later. Yeah. Is, there, is there a niche like within the community where somebody has what they think is a brilliant idea, but not they don't have the inclination or the infrastructure or the time to really, uh, or, or just can't get it going? Is, is anybody? Is there any like little uh, somebody you know is already? Slick with everything. Just take on the take on the issue, take on the, the project, or, or you know agree to it, or and then, uh, and then I don't, just I, make I, a split. You I know, think split. generally, I think generally speaking, like the idea is like point zero 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 one percent of of like actually getting something made and, and brought into the world, um, because often like as soon as your idea comes into contact with reality, it changes dramatically, um, and um, and so. I don't. I wouldn't recommend anyone take that offer. If that makes sense. Like I, it's it's, um, if it's an idea that um, that that. Yeah, I guess. But if it's an idea that like nobody else has, then it's probably not a good idea. If that makes sense. And that's why I think you argue for like let's just be transparent and like get the press release out early. Like it's not it's not about like confidentiality and like keeping your secret locked up. Like it's about. Um, sharing it with the world and execution is like is I mean you can go read the books on like marketing and business development and product development and like they will all say that execution is like 99.9% .9 of, of, of like creativity um, yeah. There's nobody like a jobber almost like just a, like a broker? I mean there might be but I don't think they're I, don't, I wouldn't take that deal. None that I know. No. Yeah. yeah I think you have to be completely personal this today um, I say that this is going to sound crazy, but I, I say that social, uh, social networks doesn't work anymore for big companies. Uh, and it's basically because if you see Facebook, for example, Facebook algorithms doesn't uh, let the companies talk anymore with people in Facebook. Because I don't like to have a Facebook full of companies telling me what to buy or what to read or anything. So it's about being completely one-to-one. -one. And I've been telling this all the time, and it's because I believe in it. If you see Coca-Cola last campaign, Coca-Cola campaigns are not, or Coke campaigns are not social. They're, in, they're not in social networks. They're 
the, your name, it's on the actual bottle of the Coke. So that's what you want. You want to be rich personal. You want to do customer service and you want to, they tell you your name. If you go to Starbucks, they go and say, hey, Juan, how are you? Do you want the same as always? I already have your coffee ready for you. They know you. Companies have to, they, they have to go one to one and they have to be super personal. And for this, you have to be clear. And if you have a problem, you just tell it. It's, this is going to take more time because this and that, or this is going to be super early. Be happy because this and that. So it's about being super personal. So I think a broker or a company that it's, it's adding more steps. It's, well, definitely, it's, definitely, it's, separate. it's separating you from your customer. But in, yeah, in other cases, like for example, Header, it's, it's, it's what they do and they know how to do it. So it's, it's, I think you, have, you need to have a balance. I mean, that, that said, I, I don't respond to backer comments or questions. This is the one time that I, as a consumer, have access to the next Lego. I love what you're doing so much. I want to be able to talk to you as a person. If I wanted to talk to Coca-Cola, there is no chance they would respond to any email or tweet. Their tweets, it's some social company that's responding to me, saying, yes, Heather, we will, we will have Mercedes put on, on a Coke can for you. Every backer and comment should be coming from you guys. Your focus, your laser focus, should be your campaign page, should be your community. It's all about community. They're telling you what your next product can be. I've, I've mapped out the next five years of some company's product lines based off of comments from your community and what they want to see it build from. So I can help with the messaging. I can help with social and press. But you really need to focus on your community because you know your product better than I ever will. I could pull it apart, but you're the one who created it, and you're the one with the, the pure passion behind it. So I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, um, how do you determine the right time of day or the time of the uh, day of the week to actually press the launch button? Like, uh, you should do the math and figure out when it's going to end. You don't want it to end on like a Sunday or a Saturday or even a Friday. I mean, I don't know. There's like this is like tactical stuff that like you could probably Google. Um, but generally, I think like not the weekends and like not Friday afternoon. It's funny. We always launch on Thursday. This is like a company <laughs> thing. You know, with Thursday is the launching day. Yeah. Probably because it's it's a day where people it's already like thinking on the weekend, like googling what's in the net. You know, Mondays are super busy days, so it's not a good day for <laughs> launching stuffs. So for us, at the end of the week, it's it's always the best. Also, the weekend give you some space. To replant, uh, to read about what's going on, to take about like answering questions, but this also gives you uh, extra responsibility, which is taking care of clients during the first weekend. This weekend, I will be at home all the time, just talking with the customers. I cannot go to the beach or whatever. <laughs> uh, but Thursday for us worked really well. I think, on from my point of view, it's don't launch on a Monday because quite frankly, a journalist is catching up on everything that was sent to them over the weekend. Make sure you're not launching on a holiday. That is, the, just please don't do that because everybody, Thanksgiving, you're at home, you're with family, you're not allowed to be on the computer because your mother won't let you. If you launch at the beginning of the week, you then have a nice wave of coverage that's gonna drive into the weekend. And if my mother is looking on the computer for a nice sweater, and she happens to see 15 articles already that might have happened earlier in the week. She's more likely going to click over. One article, you know, it exists. Two articles, it's quite interesting. I've heard of it before. But three, I'm more likely going to click over and see what this is because everyone's talking about it. Personally, I would go towards the beginning of the week. Towards the beginning. <laughs> And, and the time, actually, before I forget, the time depends on the target audience you're going after, what territory. If and what Heather said before, always be aware of what's going on during the week. Don't launch when Apple is releasing the, the new watch, or don't launch at the same time that the bigger company that is your competence is, is doing something. Always research the market before. Hi, good evening, guys. Um, I just want to know, because it said design month, right? 
So you have a different, um, like, quarterly or candidly, like, month to month. You would say, okay, fine, I would do design month, or I can, um, where's the month where, you, where I have a company where I want to um, curate, where it provides service to the people, not a design, but a service. So do y'all do service month, like, as far as like, I want to put out, or is all, when you say design, is all under that umbrella? Yeah, so, so I, I can speak to that. You know, so here at Kickstarter, every month this year, we're actually focusing on a different creative category across the site. So this month, we're celebrating design. Next month's going to be music, and it'll be others um, down the line throughout, throughout the year. So you can definitely check um, you know, either on our mailing list or on our website. We'll be talking about the kinds of events we're having here. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, with that, I mean, I think we can certainly continue the conversation. Um, we'd like to move this to the gallery where you can check out a beautiful selection of um, products that have been designed and built through Kickstarter and um, join us for some refreshments. So thank you all again for coming out. Thanks to our panelists.